So again, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is the final of a four-part series called Living with Alzheimer's. And the topic tonight is effective communication strategies. Our presenter is Dr. Carol Stevens, who has worked as a psychologist for over 35 years. She is currently on a mission to increase community awareness about changes in thinking and memory in older adults and the grave importance of early identification and intervention. Her goal is to assist older adults and their families to be intentional in planning for a future and with quality of life until the end. In her psychology practice, she specializes in treatment of depression, anxiety, insomnia, and mental health issues in adults, seniors, and their families. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carol Stevens. Thank you all for coming today. It's a very, it, it looks like a choir practice with everybody wearing their white outfits. <laughs> it's, I guess it's, we're in the thick of summer finally. Well, I just want to thank the library for continuing to offer me the opportunity to speak to people and to speak to the live stream people. And I heard earlier from these guys that 50 people have watched one of the previous archived talks and 80 people have watched another one. So I am like, I almost want to weep because my mission is to get the word about this disease out into our community so that people notice it when it's happening and they step in and they help their loved ones and other people get the help they need because people can have a good life with Alzheimer's disease if they're planful, if they know what's wrong, if, they're, if they create a team, if they get together with medical people and they really decide like, what, how do I want my life to go forward? They can be intentional early on. It's when you discover you have dementia and you're way in the middle stages of dementia and you can't think about anything or plan for anything that your life crashes and burns. So I'm really thrilled that people are interested and I thank you all for coming. And I thank the library. So I want to start out today by telling you a story about my mom. Last time I told you a goofy story about my dad. And somehow I think my parents have been gone for 10 and six years. And I think they're sending me signs that this is the right thing for me to be doing in life because both of my parents had dementia. And they both had you know, difficult, very difficult and painful ends of lives. And I was in charge, and I'm a geriatric psychologist, and I gotta say that in spite of all my years of schooling and years and years of experience, dealing with my own parents was the most informative. <laughs> because I really had to learn how to do stuff. I can tell you what to do and hope and wish you the best, send you off and wish you the best. But with me, I really have to figure out what am I gonna do and how am I gonna handle my mom? So anyways, one day I went to visit my mom at the, she lived in a senior community and I went to visit her and my mother worked at Planned Parenthood when she was younger and she had several friends who worked at Planned Parenthood in the facility and they were, serious activist bosom buddies. <laughs> and this friend of hers came up and she put her hand on my arm and she looked at me and tears poured down her face. And she said to me, I don't know how to talk to your mother. She said, I just don't know what to do because I love your mother so much. And it was just, you know, it was a wake up call because I thought, you know, I feel the same way. I don't know how to talk to my mother. And my mother was to the point in her dementia where she really couldn't understand much of anything and she just stared and she was full of anxiety and scared all the time. And she had always been a super stable, capable person that, you know, she sort of hardly ever got ruffled. When I think about it, she had four like wild teenage daughters and she barely got ruffled, you know? She just sort of trudged on and took care of stuff and, you know, told us to shape up. And anyways, in, in her late life with the dementia, she was a different person, full of anxiety and really not doing well. So I thought about, well, so what am I gonna tell this poor sad friend? Because what this friend is saying to me was like, I'm like avoiding your mother because I don't know what to do. 
And I thought, you know, this is the worst thing in the world is to avoid a person with dementia and leave them alone. So I remembered one of the things that one of my sisters, who was a forester, not a psychologist, my sister said to me, you know, I went to see mom and I realized I could either ask her what she had for breakfast, which she would never remember, or I could show her the genealogy stuff that I was working on, all the old family pictures, all the stories about Burlington, Iowa, and where she grew up. And she said, the long-term memory kicks in. The short-term memory is gone early on, but the long-term memory kicks in. And she said, mom helped me with that genealogy work. She said, I didn't have to go to the library. She said, I'd show pictures of mom, and she'd say, oh, that's so-and-so. So that long-term memory, I mean, one of the things that I want you to leave with today is if you're dealing with someone with memory problems and dementia, the long-term memory is there. You know, it is, it's, it's in the archives. It's deeply in there, but it's there. And so when you're trying to have a conversation with somebody about what happened today or yesterday or the conversation that you just had, and you can see that they don't remember anything about it, Remember that one of the earliest things that happens with dementia is that new learning ceases. That people are not going to remember new things. So what I'm going to tell you today, I see a lot of you got pens. Thank you for taking notes. But you will remember things better if you take notes. Because your mind just isn't grasping and transferring it to the long-term memory the way it did in the past. And all of us, I mean, this is not a youthful crowd for the most part, and all of us are having memory issues to, in some shape or form. I mean, I forget stuff pretty regularly, but I can backtrack with some things. You know, if you lose something and you backtrack and you say, okay, I'm gonna go back to the car and I'm gonna come in the house again and I'm gonna say, where did I put that phone? It's like, well, I could have put it there. Oh, yes! I put it there, but you got to backtrack. So all of us are forgetting things, but it really, dementia really means that you have gotten to the point where your memory is so impaired, your problem solving is so impaired that you're not able to function. Probably most of you, I don't know, actually most of the people who are at the talk about the mild cognitive impairment aren't here, so I'm just gonna say a little about it. Because mild cognitive impairment is, is a diagnosis that probably has started to be used more and more in the last 10 years. How many of you know that term, mild cognitive impairment? Okay, a little bit. Well, what it means, it is a diagnosis that doctors are using more and more, and it means that people are starting to have somewhat memory problems. They're just not remembering things the way they did. They're aware that their mind is not as clear and maybe that d dealing with complicated things. I mean, I know I find like things with a phone or a computer or complicated things. It's like my mind does not navigate that stuff the way it used to. And you, you see a 20 year old, you know, you ask him to help you and they can do it in two seconds. And you know, we're, I'm working on it for like half a day. I don't admit that very often, but <laughs> now, it's, now it's on film. So anyways, going back to the story about my mom, lack of social engagement and subsequent isolation are big, big risk factors for dementia. When people are alone, the brain is not functioning very much. As you sit here right now, all of your brains are activated. You're thinking, you're paying attention, you're probably making little mental connections with stories and situations that you know. An activated brain is push-ups for the brain. And one of the things that happens, sadly, is that people avoid people who are getting dementia. They avoid people who don't remember, who are, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you seen that? Have, have you done that? I mean, we've, we've all done it. Because it's hard to be around someone 
with dementia. And it's hard to come up with things like thinking, like with my mom, thinking, let's get the genealogy and those old family pictures out because that's going to engage a part of her that's still pretty peppy. So not only is lack of engagement and subsequent isolation one of the biggest risk factors, but more importantly, it's one of the most important contributors to longevity. Have you heard about the Blue Zone studies, the guy who did the Blue Zone studies, and he traveled all over the world, and he looked, like, where are the places that people are living, like, you know, to 100, and, you know, people are just living on and on, and they're having, like, pretty darn good lives. And one of the main things that they found in those communities was social engagement on a really regular basis, where people got out. They were part of a community. They were part of, you know, the old guys would go sit in the tavern and have a little whatever and, and chat together. So that social engagement is really important. And I can tell you that one of the things that I see as a geriatric psychologist, I go see people frequently in their homes, and I see that there are a lot of people with dementia that just never go out. They stay in the house. A caregiver is got brought in to kind of watch people. But people are not, are not actively engaging. So if there's one thing I want you to leave here with today is that effective communication requires social engagement. It requires that you really get in there with people and try hard to communicate. So let me see here. I had a PowerPoint, and what I discovered about my brain is that I can't really use a PowerPoint and talk to you and think about my own stuff and do the PowerPoint at the same time. And I recently read in a book called Remember by Lisa Genova, who is coming to town like in a couple months. She's an incredible writer and speaker. She wrote Still Alice, if some of you have seen Still Alice. She's, she's an amazing, uh, she's, I think she's a neurologist, and she's an amazing writer. Get her book, Remember. It is, it is, it is one of the few self-help books that I have read several times from cover to cover. Usually I get 50 pages in and I say, that's enough. But this book, Remember, is really a brilliant book about memory. So, Lisa Genova. And, and I liked her book, it was reassuring, because she said it's really common that older people cannot multitask anymore, that it just isn't, the brain just isn't working the way it did when it was younger. And it's not that you have dementia, it's just that we don't really have the mental firepower that we did when we were younger. And I kind of like that idea. So let's, let's talk about what happens with dementia and changing in cognition as time goes on. Um, Folks with dementia oftentimes have a lot of difficulty expressing their thoughts, their feelings, their needs, their desires. They have trouble expressing who they are. And one of the reasons that I'm giving you this form, what matters most, is I've seen too many people who are way deep into dementia and people who don't know them are taking care of them and they don't know who they are as a human being. And when you think about who you are, what you love, what matters to you, you know, it's not, it's, it's, you don't have to write a book. It's simple things. I mean, I want, let's just like, let's just shout out and say it loud because we need to, we need to hear it on there. Shout out, what is, what is something that you know you can't live without? Gardening. Gardening. <laughs> what else? Pets. What else? Reading. 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 What else? Cooking. Cooking. What else? Crossword. Crossword puzzles. What else? What? Driving. Driving. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Hiking. I love to hike. My body loves to move. It is a drug for me, a moving body. I think about being a psychologist for all the years that I did where I would sit eight hours a day in a chair with clients and I love to move. And so when I write what matters most, I wanna make sure that whoever takes care of me, if by any chance I get dementia, knows that I don't wanna sit in a chair all day. 
I want them to know that what I love to do is to get up and wander around and observe the world. I call myself an observer of the universe. Any other observers of the universe? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us move here because of that. So I really want you to fill out the What Matters Most to You document, and I want you to put this with the information that you want to discuss with your power of attorney so that if something happens to you, people really know these are the things that we got to do for this person in taking care of them in the next stage of their life. Because people with dementia are not able to say, I want to go for a walk. I want a bar of this kind of chocolate. I want a certain kind of crossword puzzle. Easy. I want easy crossword puzzles. So please fill out this form. It is, it is not a legal form, as you can say. And it, you probably don't have to put a million things on here. I mean, as I told this story a while ago at one of my other talks about my dad, who was a sailor. And my dad was very demented at the end of his life. And I mean, I knew how demented he was when one day the Super Bowl was on. And I went over to his house and I thought, oh, dad's going to be watching the Super Bowl. And I walked in and he was asleep in his chair. And I said, how come you're not watching the Super Bowl? And he's like, what? I said, oh, the Super Bowl's on. So I, I said, hey, let's turn it on. So we turned the Super Bowl on. And my dad was the kind of guy who knew every player, every statistic. You know, he knew that Super Bowl was on, like, you know, a, 10 years in advance, the date that it was going to be on. And I knew his dementia was really severe when, when he was not able to remember that, this. But the thing that I realized about my dad was that he loved to sail, and he loved to talk about sailing. He loved to talk about his experiences when he was young. And so when I went over, I would bring a sailboat trophy, and I would put it in the middle of the table, and I'd say, let's talk about sailing. And then my dad would tell me the story. There was one particular story that he told me, you know, maybe 2,000 times. And, he, you know, it was a story about him, him and his brother who were really fantastic sailors when they were youngsters. And they, they did the race, they won the race, and then they ran into the judge's boat, and the judge's boat sunk. <laughs> and he loved that story so much. So on time number 2000, a person with dementia is telling it for the first time. And I realized, like, you know, I don't have to be very innovative with my dad. I don't have to come up with fantastic, new, fascinating, interesting things to chit-chat with him, or I don't need to read in the newspaper about the new Alzheimer's drug to discuss with him. You know, I just have to ask him about the sailing story. And it put my dad right into a moment of joy and happiness. And when he was happy, I was happy. You know what I mean? I mean, that is the goal in dealing with people with dementia and communication, is to find things that are going to make them happy. So people also have difficulty not only expressing their thoughts and their feelings, but they have difficulty decoding and interpreting the data that is coming into their brain about the world. And actually, there's studies that have just come out recently in the last week about people's vision and that they're saying that vision problems sometimes are, are tied to dementia. And that people are having less, they don't know if it's a causal thing or, you know, is something that, I mean, that causes dementia, that contributes to dementia, or whether the dementia causes the problems with vision. But people's vision gets impaired related to dementia. So people's vision gets impaired. People hear differently. They don't hear what we normally hear. They smell things. They, they're, usually people's smell gets very bad. I used to work with a neuropsychologist who said we're going to do the peanut butter test. He said, we don't have to do anything too fancy. We just get a jar of peanut butter, and we have people smell it. And frequently, people with dementia, their, their smell is not working. You know, the, these parts of the brain are starting to have more and more neurodegeneration. The brain cells are dying. And I think of it as connectivity. The brain is like a big, long-distance telephone system communicating 
sending communications from one part to the other, and putting together things. And the communication is just, there's a lot of interference going on with, with the plaques and tangles that are in the brain with an Alzheimer's person. And with lesions, when people have strokes, there are parts of the brains where there's, where there's neurodegeneration or death of brain cells. So the, the brain just doesn't function adequately and successfully. So not only do people have trouble with memory and thinking, they have problems with decoding uh, perceptions. But last but not least is the people's environment and their home become unfamiliar. And a place where normally they were safe and comfortable sometimes becomes unfamiliar. Sometimes people will say, this is not my house. Whose house am I in? Where's my house? Or where are my kids? You know, someone who's 90 who's looking for their little kids. So the home and just sort of the whole timeline of life get, can get very disrupted. And it causes huge problems with communication because people think things are going on that aren't going on. And of course, what do you do? You want to straighten them out. You want to say, OK, this is, this is what you need to do, right? And Unfortunately, I think uh, one of the things that's, that's most complicated in my work with people is that it seems that there is a power dynamic in most relationships. I mean, when you think about the power dynamic, I see heads going here. We got bobbleheads in here. That there, in every relationship, you know, every friendship, every marital relationship in particular, there's a power dynamic. Like, who's got the power? Who's in control? Who's the one who, in the end, we're going to do what they want to do? Who's the one who says, you know, I don't really care what we do. I'll just do whatever you want to do, right? And that power dynamic in relationships with dementia totally shifts. It totally shifts from, I mean, you know, ideally, we have a kind of a collaborative power dynamic where you say what you want, and I say what I want, and then we kind of come to, you know, an understanding. But with dementia, that power dynamic really shifts where the person who is the caregiver is completely in charge of how things are going to go. And so what I see a lot is that people rely on their ability to reason and to communicate and to kind of figure out like how, when you think about the last time you wanted to like say to somebody, kind of make a point, and you spend a fair amount of time in your life thinking about like, how am I going to make this happen? You know, what do I need to say? How am I going to say it? What's the tone of voice? What's my attitude? But I think that the, the living with someone with dementia becomes increasingly frustrated. It becomes increasingly frustrated for, one's, for the person with dementia because they kind of know that they're not able to think and get what they want and get their needs met. But they're not able to say, hey, I need this. I, like, I, want, I want to do this now. Well, that's a lovely phone. <laughs> it's okay. Anybody else? <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought. No, no, it's all right. It'll come back. It comes back to me usually. Where was I? Oh, the power dynamics. Okay, thank you, thank you. That was a, that was a big blip. Uh, so the power dynamics are really important, and it's really important to be aware of that when you're in a relationship with someone with dementia, because I think the tendency is to feel like, I got, now I got to do everything, and so you feel like you got to make stuff happen. And so, you know, what's the inclination when you got to make stuff happen? You know, you get, you get more pushy, you get more controlling, you get more demanding, you know, you get more critical. You kind of, you want, you want to try all these, like, what are all the strategies that I might use to get this person to do what I want? And this is the biggest takeaway for today, is that people with dementia have a reality, and it is probably not your reality. They believe stuff, they think stuff that may or may not be real. 
Have people seen things with people in their lives that they think, wow, that's, ooh, that's different. What have you seen? Yeah. So what have you seen? What have you seen in her that's like really off? She's always, she was calling for her dad. She she's was, calling for her dad. She's calling for her dad nonstop, nonstop at the end. And um, sure. You know, you yeah, other. Very soon, you know? it's, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> so that's a fantastic answer. So. What you got to do is go with people's reality and say, you know, this is crazy. Or if people are in facilities, oftentimes they're completely medicated. They're put on, you know, sedating medications, which certainly does not make them better. Because it's that the brain isn't functioning and, and people, you know, they just don't really know what's, what is real and what is not real anymore. And they have no capacity to work through and determine that. So it is your job to say to yourself, stop, stop, when you are trying to convince someone with dementia that their, th their thinking is off. You are never gonna convince someone with dementia that their dad is dead, you know? I mean, you could, you could go get the obituary and see, dad is dead, he's gone, he's been gone for so long. Well. I mean, again, going back to what is the point of effective communication is to give somebody with dementia joy and pleasure. And if you say, you know what, your dad was the most fantastic guy. He was so handsome and he was so talented. I remember when he did such and such. And what do you see? You see her light up because you're connecting her with the positive things in her life. So when you hear people talking about stuff that you know is not real, say to yourself, I've got to like become, you know, I've, in some ways it's like improvisational theater. Like what am I going to do? What am I going to come up with? How, how am I going to handle this in a way that works? And there's no right or wrong. I mean, it is, it is improvisation. But oftentimes if you come up, for example, yesterday I saw somebody who really needs caregivers. And she was, she was just kinda, she's very tough and independent, and the idea of having a caregiver was pretty mortifying to her. And then I said, you know what? The word caregiver is not very appealing. Let's call it a personal assistant. And I said, you know what? You need a personal assistant. And she said, oh, you're right. <laughs> Absolutely, we could do this, we could do this. You know, I mean, it was like a miracle, but I thought, you know what? This is the stuff you got to improvise and you got to think, okay, these words that I'm using, are they going to work? You know, I mean, forcing a caregiver on, you probably have all known people who need caregivers and to get, you know, get most of the kinds of people who live, you know, we're the rugged individualists out here in Sun Valley and to get people to accept a caregiver, it is really tough. You know, I, I rarely have I heard someone say, that would be great. I would just love someone to come over to my house for two or three hours and hang around with me all day. You know, that, that's, but, but so having a different approach, thinking about what's their reality and how am I gonna, you know, fit in with their reality, go with what is gonna work with them. So, I've got this lovely little book. Oh, actually, I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna go, go with something else here. But let's, let's just talk about the actual communication stuff that we are, the, the Alzheimer's Association PowerPoint would have shown you this. So I'm just gonna review this a little bit about the stages of Alzheimer's. And the, in the early stages with mild cognitive impairment, you can have a regular conversation with people. Maybe they're thinking, and their memory is not quite as good. But in general, you can have a meaningful conversation and you can engage in normal social activities. But when you start to move into Alzheimer's disease, sometimes people's thinking gets worse. They have more and more trouble finding the, wrong, the right words. They use familiar words. They, they're, they're, 
their literacy and their ability to speak clearly gets less and less and less. So sometimes people will see an object and they'll look at a lamp and they'll say, well, you know that, that thing that you, that you turn on to light up the room? Have you heard people do that? Where like the word, again, this is the interpreting the world and the brain is just not making the connections that it did to pull up that word. That's a lamp, might be a light. So that happens very regularly. People easily lose their train of thought. People with dementia have problems with attention and concentration and focus. So they might be in the middle of something and all of a sudden, oh, I'm sorry, I just revealed that to you moments ago. <laughs> but people easily lose their train of thought. I hear lots of people say, younger people who are ADD and ADHD are kind of a big deal in the in you know sort of younger generations these days. And I hear a lot of young people saying, my mom has ADHD or ADD. Have you heard that? And at, at this stage of life, that diagnosis is not really particularly useful. But what is useful to know is that this is a part of dementia, that the brain just has a harder time focusing its energy on one thing and staying intact. You might find that your reading is not, does anybody find that maybe you're reading your concentration when you're really wanting to focus on something that is just not quite what it was? And it's because you just don't have the mental energy that you did in the past. But with Alzheimer's, this gets worse and worse. So people, I've, I've heard a lot of people say they watch TV with their partner with dementia and the person's just can't figure out what the heck is going on in these shows. Like, who are those people? What, what happened? I mean, some of them are pretty complicated. You gotta give them that. But that ability to really stay on task and put things together in an ongoing way is something that starts to deteriorate in the kind of in the more middle stages of dementia. So don't make assumptions about when, if you hear that someone has Alzheimer's, don't make assumption that they're a hopeless case. Make an assumption that like they're probably a really smart person with a huge history, with a huge self, what matters most to you, and that what's important is to really get on top of who that person is and what they love to do. And when you're, the more you're communicating with that person, the more you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna to talk to that person about the things that I know matter most to them about. So ask people, I mean, ask your friends, take notes, write this stuff down, make sure that people know for you what's important. It's important not to exclude people. Oftentimes, Somebody with dementia will be in a room with, you know, with somebody who's interviewing them and they will just be interviewing the family member and they basically ignore the person with dementia. And it's really important to pay attention to the person with dementia because they're still a person and they're still there. And if, oftentimes if you give people attention and you ask them questions in a way that's effective, and one of the most effective ways to ask questions is to ask a yes, no question. That oftentimes people are not able to come up with things on their own. If you say, well, what do you, what do you like to do? That's a big question. And it requires a lot of firing of a lot of brain cells. And people with dementia aren't gonna come up with answers to open-ended questions. You know, what are you most interested in? What do you think is gonna happen with the political situation in this country? <laughs> you know, that is a big one. So you ask yes, no questions. You say, I'm gonna simplify the conversation. And you ask people a question, do you wanna do this or do you wanna do that? And so the choices are limited. You know, sometimes people can't even do one, two, but I really like for people not to complete, caregivers not to take complete charge and say, this is what you're gonna do, this is what you're gonna wear, here's your dinner. I, you know, I think that treating people as a human being, they, they get to have choices is really, really important, important, but let them have choices in a way that they're gonna be successful. 
I know, I know I went out to dinner with my dad one time. It was a Mother's Day, and we, our whole family went out to this fancy French restaurant. And my dad looked at the waiter, and he said, I'll have a half a turkey sandwich. And the, and the guy said, sir, we don't have turkey sandwiches. This is a fancy French restaurant. And my dad said, I'll have a half a turkey sandwich. And my sisters and I all kind of looked at the guy like, get the sandwich. But I mean, to me, that was, a, it was an example of a very limited mindset. My dad ate a half a turkey sandwich every noon for probably four years with a glass of lemonade. And there was no variation. And when variation was offered to him, he did not want it. So it made it easy for me. I used to make him pot roast and all this stuff. It was like, oh, thank God, all I need to do is share a sandwich with him. But so, yes, no questions, or very limited choices. Think about when you're communicating with someone, what you want to do is really simplify the conversation. You want to ask them just about something where there is an answer. You, want, you might even want to like, tell them the answer and ask them about that. You know, sort of have a conversation around the answer. So that they're, because their brains are not producing, you know, a whole lot of deep thought at this stage. And really what you want is to have a happy engagement, a happy, pleasant engagement. And the more you involve who, like, who they are and what you know about them, the happier they're going to be. I mean, this is, this, I gave you this form because I think this is really the essence of all of this communication, is it comes from knowing who the person is and what matters to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK. You know, it's not rocket science, but it needs to be done ahead of time. It needs to be known ahead of time. I mean, in this community, there are a lot of people who don't have anybody. And if they get demented to a certain point, they don't have anybody who really knows like, who they are. And to me, that's dreadfully sad that, you know, that, that people lose who they are. People say that's what happens with dementia is you lose yourself. I don't think you lose yourself. I think it's all still there, but we got to like, keep it we got to you know, keep it on the, on the front line. So we got to have people around who know who they are. So the middle stages of communication, <clears throat> you want to engage the person on a one-to-one. -one. Again, very quiet space, no distractions. When there's a lot of distractions, when the radio's on, the TV's on, the animals are running around the house, you know, that is all mental clutter. And people are having a hard enough time just focusing on the yes, no issue. And if there are all these other things going on, the brain just gets more and more cluttered. And so really think about making sure that your environment is quiet and peaceful if you're trying to engage with people. You want to speak more slowly. You want to speak more clearly. You want to be really patient. This is where patience is a virtue stuff comes in. <laughs> Maintain eye contact and really show the person that you're there with them. And remember that really the goal of communication with dementia completely changes. And I think, you know, most of our conversations, most of our interactions, we have text messages, we have phone calls, most of it is super goal oriented. Most of it we're calling, we got someone, something we want to tell people, you know, I'll see you at noon at KB's for a burrito or I'll do this, or I'll do that. Aren't most of your communications very goal-oriented? I mean, most people these days don't really call each other just to chat, or even get together just to chat. I mean, a lot of conversation is really goal-oriented. And with someone with dementia, you are not going to have goal-oriented conversation. And if you find yourself thinking, I got to make this happen, I got to make this person understand that they have to do this, they have to change their clothes, they have to take a shower. These things, I mean, a lot of people with dementia, they don't want to take a shower. A lot of people grew up without a shower, and a shower for them is not a familiar thing, and people are scared to death of showers. You will see that many, many people with dementia you know, you just can't get them clean because they're scared of the shower, they're scared of the bathtub. They perceive the water in the bathtub and the depth of the water is mysterious. As I said, people's perceptions change. So it's really important to 
understand that you know, forcing people into the shower or the bathtub, isn't, isn't, it's, it's not a successful strategy. And the strategy is to say, you know what, I'm going to give them a bird bath. I'm going to wash their armpits and their crotch. We're going to somehow, you know, maybe we're going to use a wipe to wash, clean their bottom when they go to the bathroom. You know, you've got to come up with all these strategies that are different and that you would never imagine you would do. But, but you want to be respectful, and there are certain things you want to accomplish. You do have to completely alter your expectations, because I know I see some people who really want the person to be the same person they've always been, to look the way they've always looked, to be dressed and groomed the way they've always been. And I think it is helpful to try to let go of some of those expectations. You know, not that you're going to let people completely deteriorate and, you know, look like a disaster, but I think you got to you got to sort of pick your pick your poison. You know, you got to pick your battles just like, you know, with teenage kids, you got to pick your battles. You know, they're going to yeah, I hear some laughing. Yeah, they're going to, you know, they're going to do what they're going to do and these pe people with dementia are real people with real feelings and thoughts and impressions and real understanding about how they want to be in the world and maybe how they want to be in the world is different than it used to be. Actually a friend told me a good story about this just recently and the story was that they were going to a wedding and her husband who was is a little confused put on a black shirt that was like linen and it was just like nothing but a wrinkle. You know it had been like in a ball in a drawer and she said to him honey your shirt's kind of wrinkly. Like, maybe this isn't the right thing to wear to the wedding. And he said, black, wrinkly shirts are totally in. <laughs> and she said, well, honey. And she said, you know, I could see that this battle was going to be lost one way or another. And, and then she said to him, you know what, that shirt is short-sleeved, and it's really cold out. I think you should put on a long-sleeved shirt. And he said, oh, you're right. This is a summer shirt. So it was over. So think about improvisation, you know? I mean, I just thought that, I told my friend, I'm going to use that in one of my talks because it's a beautiful example of just thinking outside of the box. You know, this isn't working, and God knows I don't want to go with my husband looking like a wrinkly teenager to this wedding with all of our old friends but you know sometimes the wrinkly teenager is going to show up it's going to happen and you got to you got to let that go so communication in the late stages in the late stages people really are not able to understand or express themselves at all verbally so there is a lot that goes on nonverbal and know that i mean in the late stages but also in all stages of life that there are the other aspects of communication. We have the tone of voice. We have the tone of voice. Or we have the body language. Change that shirt. <laughs> or we have the scowl. Right? I mean, my guess is that each of us is masterful in some of these things. And we think, you know, they are, they're kind of power plays. And with people with dementia, this is, this is really the level of reality that they are at, is living in kind of an emotional realm of picking up the emotions. And so people with dementia are very, very sensitive to your tone of voice. They're very sensitive to your body language. They're very sensitive to your words. In fact, one of the things that's interesting to me is that verbally, the brain really hangs on to things that it hangs on to, to um, what it hears way better than it hangs on to words and what it hears, but the, the verbal literacy. And so sometimes it's helpful to, when you go into a house and you see that the person may not know who you are, to go around behind them and say, hi, mom, it's Carol, because they will recognize your voice. They may not recognize your face. I mean, that might be because you're older, but, <laughs> but 
oftentimes people don't, the facial recognition goes, and sometimes people with dementia, they look at themselves in the mirror and they don't know who they are. They don't recognize themselves. And again, you know, that's the brain is just no longer interpreting the input from the outer world appropriately. And so people become, the foundation of a lot of who they are becomes emotional and the nonverbal stuff. So like being aware of how you are nonverbally. And I think a lot of us, I mean, I know for myself that if I in a situation where I'm getting worked up and my words aren't working, like I'll ramp up the volume. You know, I like start to like get short of breath, get worked up. And I think this is going to work. You know, I don't know. Does it work for, for people when people are, talk to you like that? When people talk to me like that, I pick it up in a nanosecond, right? Do you notice when people are talking to you with a, with a tone or an attitude? Yeah. And so people with dementia, you know, I'm, I'm saying these words up here, but these words are really not meaning much. But so what they're just, what they're hearing is the tone and the volume and the attitude. So you want to work on your tone and your volume and, and attitude. And you want to just think, how can I be the kindest, most loving person with this person? When I see people who are really pretty advanced in dementia, I usually go in and I tell them my name and I sit and I look at them. And I almost always touch people. I almost always touch people's arm or kind of try to hold their hand a little bit because there's something about that human contact that is profound for people. And it's profound from people that aren't, you know, there's, there's no goal here in our interaction. There's, there's nothing we're trying to accomplish in terms of communicating to you that we're gonna go out to lunch or that we need to do this or that. I mean, the goal is just kind, sweet interaction. It's kind, sweet connection. Does that make sense? You know, I mean, I think, that, I think realistically, when I was thinking about doing this talk today, I thought, you know, really the bottom line is that this is true in all aspects of our life. <laughs> this is who we should all try to be wherever we are. But with people with dementia, it's even more essential that we be aware that it is that level of our being and our presence that is really going to make a difference with people with dementia. And that we have to not be scared of those people. And that, and that we, when we work with people with dementia in the advanced stages, they're much more, their life is really about their senses. So what we want to do is bring things that is going to help with sensory awareness. And, you know, that might be bring some lovely smelling hand lotion and rub their hands, give them a hand rub or a foot rub, bring some flowers and smell the flowers with them. Take a walk and look at the sky and the clouds and the birds and the flowers for you guys who love to garden. You know, for me, I think if somebody would take me out in the yard and just let me look at the beautiful flowers, I mean, I could do that for a long time and get joy. So I think that's kind of all I have to say to you today. And I guess the, 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 the oh, actually, no, I, I, I forgot this part. I want to wrap up with Maya Angelou. And the word is that people think that this quote is from her, but they're not sure. <laughs> I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. So again, it's how you make people with dementia feel. And you don't have to engage in a goal-oriented conversation with people who have significant dementia, but you have to know who they are, and you have to kind of indicate that you know who they are. Oh, you know what? I remember when your kid who was, you know, 13 years old, that beautiful kid, and you can talk about that. Like, bring up old memories. Don't bring up what happened yesterday or today or what's happening on TV. Bring up what happened years ago. Bring up the sailboat race. Bring up, you know, you know the people in your life and the, and the stories that they are really connected to and bring them joy. So bring those things up. <clears throat> That's it. That's it.
Carol, would you be open to any questions? Yeah, I'm open to questions. Okay. Um, Have we got some questions? So I'll pass the um, uh, microphone around so that the people who are watching this um, via our live stream and the video can, can hear your question. <laughs> it's okay, it's just a microphone. Um, I'd like an example, if, if you can, of I'd like to have a turkey sandwich or I want to have a turkey sandwich. Mm -hmm. If you are the person with that person and there is no half a turkey sandwich, how do you deflect that without embarrassing the person? Right, I'm right. Not, I'm not expressing myself. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Does anybody have, you know what, I, I would imagine that some of you have had experience with this. Does anybody have any suggestions? I don't have to be the only person in the know. Do you, did you, you look like you had something right on the tip of your tongue. You know, you know, you just kind of try to be cheerful about the whole thing and maybe come up with something that looks just like a turkey sandwich, you know, that they do have. Find out what they do have to offer that looks very similar and tastes even better yet. <laughs> I, I can't remember what they brought. I like improvise. That was a good word that you used, Carol. Yeah. Yes. Creativity. Hey, we can do that. Some, sometimes it's helpful. Oh, I don't know if I... Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. I have a microphone. So, sometimes it's helpful to just go with their reality. I mean, go with what they want and say, you know what, I know how much you love those turkey sandwiches. They are so delicious. Like, you've been eating turkey sandwiches for so long, you probably don't even know what other stuff tastes like. You know, I goof around a lot with people because I think, you know, this is not deadly serious. Like, we gotta just sort of move through life and figure out how to, <laughs> how to make stuff happen. So, to, to be light about it, but to take it seriously and I think the minute you get into saying, no, we don't have that. You gotta have something else. You gotta order something else. It's to say, you know, it's to kind of go with it for a while and stay with it and be positive about it and kind of find what they love about it. And then say, you know what, I'm gonna have this. How about we share it? Okay. You know, it's, it's always improvisation. I mean, I wish there were like right and wrong answers to this. But it is always an experiment. And some people are more stubborn than others. I mean, some people, you know, this is, this is the real world. Some people are more stubborn and they're not gonna do it. So you're gonna have to work harder to figure out what you're gonna do. Okay. With, with the line, would you be willing to? Would that work with somebody like that? Would you be willing to share a meal tonight? Would you be willing to have rice and veggies for a change? You know, that willing. I think I don't for know somebody in early Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. you're still using reason. I see. But I think when people get to the middle of Alzheimer's, their ability to reason deteriorates markedly. And so part of it is emotion, and part is that, you know, that people just kind of make a decision and that's it. You know, like my dad made a decision. At, at night, he just ate a hamburger. I mean, that was all he ate all day. My sisters would say, get him to eat vegetables, Carol. And I said, you know what, he's not going to, and he's not gonna die. So, you know, part of it is you kind of making a decision that you're gonna do something different. But, I mean, but there are times when we just don't have it. It, it, it can't be done. So you do have to like, you know, kind of figure out like what else are we gonna do? How are we gonna sidestep this? But I think using reason, forget your reasonable self. You know, this is like having a reasonable self with a three-year-old. Like good luck with that, right? <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's, it seems mean to compare a person with dementia to a three-year-old, but, but the cognitive process is not a whole lot different that people really just, they haven't, they don't have the brain connectivity and the capacity to comprehend and to understand and to put together problem solving. When you, when you think about what you do day in and day out, our lives have so much problem solving. 
almost every minute of every day. I mean, we're all going to walk out here and we're going to, like, like, first of all, we're going to say, now, where's my car? You know, like, right? I mean, the good news is it's probably not too lost because we live here. But we're going to think, where's my car? And then we're going to think, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? All day long, our brain is going like that. And a person with dementia, the brain is not all day long going like that. The person with dementia maybe has some thoughts. And oftentimes, I say there's kind of a tape loop in there where people just have repetitive thoughts and they kind of stick to certain things and they perseverate and they say the same things over and over again. And again, that is their reality. And so to say, you've said that 20 times today. We probably all said that. But you know what you say is, you know you say you don't, did somebody say no. shut up? <laughs> oh no, that's the wrong answer. Yes. Well, you know what? I mean, I think, I think there are so many people who communicate like this thinking that it's going to be effective because they sort of feel like people are fed up. You know, it's, uh, this, this is, it's an enormous challenge to deal with an adult with dementia. You know, with a kid, if they're bad or if they're a nuisance, you can put them in their room and you can say, stay there. And with an adult, you've got a human being. You've got a person with a mind and thoughts and everything you know, wishes, and you got to respect that. So it is a super duper challenge. You know what, I think we need to call it quits. The yeah. end. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to ask, answer a few more questions after this turns off. You know, we have some questions from the live stream. Um, Wow. Since we can't connect like we used to with our loved ones, are there any specific communication strategies, whoops, you recommend for us to be able to still connect with our loved ones? Does music count? Music counts as much as anything there is. Music counts as much as any, in fact, I'm kind of obsessed with music right now. There is an incredible YouTube, or not YouTube, um, Netflix uh, documentary called Alive Inside. And it is about a guy who's a social worker who decides that he is going to put together, you can see I'm obsessed. He puts together playlists for people of their very favorite music. And this, this video called Alive Inside is absolutely incredible about people in nursing homes. This guy goes around to nursing homes and he puts together personal playlists, of really the favorite songs. When I say to you, what's your favorite music? You know, I would say like the Pointer Sisters, put on these, you know, these songs that I know, like the minute they go on, I'm gonna, my whole being comes to life. And what you see, is that this music, it touches a part of the brain that really is not terribly affected by dementia. And so people have this good part of their brain. People, you know, will start singing hymns. They'll start singing Amazing Grace. People who have never spoken for two years will tap into their music. So in this video, Alive Inside, that one of the doctors says, you know, it's kind of crazy that the FDA and the nursing homes, they'll all say, well, we'll pay for those antipsychotics or those antidepressants to sedate people and to make them feel better. But we're not going to pay to put together something like this for 50 bucks, put a playlist on. I put this together to take to a patient who loves Andre Bocelli. And he sits and stares all day long. And you know, you can put something that people love, and you'll see on this Alive Inside, people come to life. It's, it, it, it's a thing that I've watched 10 times, and every time I watch, I cry because it's so powerful how it touches a part of people. That's so important. I mean, think about when you listen to the tunes that you most love and how it just, you know, it sort of makes your body want to dance like you used to dance, and it makes you want to sing, and it makes you want to wiggle and sing along. And then it gets your brain like start, starting to pull up memories about the time when that music was going on, you know. And hey, um, related to that, I have, I have to say Jonah. this because it's totally related to that. I had a patient for years and years, and her husband had been a train conductor. 
and oh. and they were huge Louis L'Amour reader book, book book readers. And when I was with her for years in her house up north, I went around her whole house and I saw stuff that had been in their lives, and he had passed. And so I got Louis L'Amour books out of their library, and I started reading them to her. And then, because her husband was a train conductor, I'm getting goosebumps, um, I told her, she, one day she said to me, out of the blue, because we were talking about the trains, and, and I said, let's put on some train music. So we put, doo, doo, you know, as they go through, and she started talking about trains, and then one day she says, the train is coming. And I immediately picked up on that, and for the next eight months, we had train adventures. I'd get there, and she'd say, I need to get on seat number 10 because it's window seat. And I said, absolutely, you don't want to be on the shady side. Let's be on the sunny side today. <laughs> for six or eight months, we were on trains. Oh my God, that is a beautiful story. Now this is improvisation, right? This is knowing who they are, well, just by going around her house and observing right. what had been like horses or trains or whatever. Right. And it just, she goes, I'm going to get on the bus and I'm going to find my husband. I said, I know you are. Can I go with you? And she goes, nope, it's my husband, not yours. Oh, my God. That is a beautiful story. I might steal that. You might hear me doing a talk and telling that story like it's mine, but... <laughs> Oh, that is incredible. Mm -hmm. My guess is that everybody in here has had an experience like that with people that you know where you tap into something that you just think, man, this is magic. You know, it's magic. But really, it's just who they are, and it's tapping in. It's like helping bring that person back to life because they can't do it themselves. So it is our job as the caregivers or the personal assistants to help that happen. So thank you all for coming and being here. It's been, I've had fun. Yes, thank you so, so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A couple of reminders. Um, Dr. Carroll mentioned this book. Oh, Creating Moments of Joy. This is a little tiny book. I was going to do have a little story time today, but of course I ran out of time. But it's a little book about just things you can do and like approaches you can have with people. So the person on the live stream, uh, that's, they're probably off, right? Not necessarily. Oh, if it's still on. It's called Creating Moments of Joy. You can get it on Amazon. I think it's under $10. It's not an expensive book. Creating Moments of Joy. Jolene Brackley, B-R-A-C-K-E-Y, Bracky. It's a great book, and it's a great book that has all kinds of sort of this improvisational stuff that we're talking about, just things that people find that work. Now, last but not least, I just want to announce that I'm starting a Caregiver Support and Education Group at the Senior Connection on August 15th. And the Senior Connection has kindly approved us using a grant that they have to put the, put the, the group on for free. And it's going to be Wednesdays, August 16th, from 1 to 2.30 for six weeks. We'll do a little educational piece. We'll talk about, you know, whatever people want to talk about. It is yet to be, yet to be determined. We have Ashley Skates in the back here. And Ashley is an aging services management practitioner. She's just gotten a master's degree, and it is a whole new field. It's a whole new degree. And... So she's got the, this really wonderful skill set that I don't have and that I don't think many people here have. So Ashley's going to come and speak at the group at least once and offer help with that. Yes. What resources would you recommend for, for me or the people like this that I've, my mother is long gone 
but I find that I have yet to make peace with her going because it, it was not nice. She was just mad. Mm -hmm. um, and I was not able to create any nice moment with her. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, for myself, m making peace with what happened, uh, what's, what resources uh, would you recommend? Well, that, it's an interesting question, you know. I mean, I think w what you're talking about is grief. But it also sounds like you kind of are guilt tripping yourself that somehow you should have been able to do better. And I feel the same way about my mom. I mean, my mom was, you know, she was so terrified and frightened and, you know, she told me to shut up, which she never in a million years would have done. You know, it was an awful end. It was an awful end. But, you know, it was a dementia end. Unfortunately, dementia is so damn unpredictable. You never know what you can get. You know, now and then people will say, oh, my parent was demented and they became so nice and fun and playful. And then other people say, oh, you know, my, my parent became a sex maniac, you know, and my dad's in the nursing home and he's trying to have sex with all the women. And, you know, that doesn't go over very well in the nursing home. <laughs> and, and, you know, a lot of people get mean and they get mean because you know, they're unhappy inside, and they don't know what to do with it, and, and to make them happy sometimes, you know, it's sort of beyond our, our possibilities. So, I mean, in some ways, it seems like it's important for you to be able to find some forgiveness for yourself for not knowing any better, you know, and for, and for having a situation that's impossible. I mean, my guess is that have other people in here had situations in life that have been impossible where you kind of feel like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, like no matter what you do, it's not going to turn out. Anybody else recognize that feeling? Yeah. I don't know. You know, I mean, if you're a person that has some spiritual connections, thinking about this as a spiritual issue and finding some forgiveness... But it, just in terms of the geriatrics world, I don't know. I don't know if there's any any services in particular. Maybe the hospice people. Maybe talking to the people at hospice. I don't know. Are you connected to them? I inquired once and never got the answer back. So. Oh, you know what? There's a social worker there by the name Ginny Wilson who's really terrific. And I think she's kind of new. She's, I don't think they had a social worker in, in the past. You might want to, you know, you might want to connect with Ginny. She's really, really, really good. She worked at the Huntsman. She worked in cancer. And, you know, she's seen suffering and difficulty in her day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the nice thing about the hospice here is that they're willing to get involved with people. Once people have a diagnosis of dementia, they're willing to get involved with families and to be an additional support system. And that's, you know, that's not the norm for hospice. And it's really super great that we have that in this community. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, so we just had an audience member comment about um, the quality of services that our hospice offers here, which is um, very exceptional, even if you look nationwide. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, we didn't have enough of these What Matters to You Most documents in the beginning. Um, now we have some extra copies, and we will post that on our, live st on our um, video, so we'll have that there. Also, um, Carol has a couple of three brochures from Alzheimer's talking about specific topics on that table. Uh, if you would be so kind as to fill out your um, short survey, I would appreciate that very much. And you can just drop it in the turquoise box on the table there. And last but not least, I think that um, Carol really appreciates if people sign in. Um, she does that on behalf of the Alzheimer's Association, who likes to keep track of just how many people she's able to reach. So um, please join me again in thanking Dr. Carol Stevens. And thanks so much for coming. <laughs>